Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour, Season 7. Our goal with this podcast is to help you remember the goodness in life. Remember the goodness inside of you. Remember the goodness inside of everyone else. This world has been so challenging for many years now, and I think we need a reminder that it's going to be okay. We're going to be okay. We can trust ourselves to make it through this challenging life. And this podcast is your reminder. Each and every week, we have a special guest who's going to come here and remind you it's going to be okay. We got this together. Good morning. I welcome our esteemed guest who I've been waiting to interview for eight months now. <laughs> welcome Anuradha Gupta. So nice to have you here. It's wonderful to be here on your podcast. So Anu, I know you through Stevie Ingram, and today we're going to talk about best practices and understanding cultural competence in healthcare specific to LGBTQIA plus issues. Why don't you give our guests just a little bit of your background? Because as we were saying prior to going on live, you come from an Ayurvedic background. And I think that the Ayurvedic people might be a little bit ahead of the yoga therapy people. And you could provide us with a template of where we might be going within the next few years. So what's your background? I am originally an engineer, MBA, and I got mm -hmm. into Ayurveda. I studied Ayurveda in the last few years. I became an Ayurvedic doctor. In Ayurveda, we have really not been talking as much about the LGBTQIA plus community, but Stevie and I have done a lot of work. I particularly made this part of my AD research, my Ayurvedic doctor program research, where I explored best practices for culturally competent care. And then that was peer reviewed. And I presented that at the National Ayurvedic Medical Association conference. And I wrote a few articles about my research. So basically, yoga therapy being the psycho spiritual aspect where, you know, we help people get back to their body, especially where there is, you know, we need to manage trauma informed care. That is very, very useful. The reason I became a yoga teacher in the first place was because for a lot of my clients, I recommend yoga and I want to tailor it. I want to personalize it. So yeah. Ayurveda has a clinical aspect to it. So clinically, when we deal with clients, we need to know a lot more about what are the systemic issues for, say, the lesbian community or the transgender community and then the healthcare issues. We need to know if they are transitioning medically because here in the US, we are not licensed healthcare practice. We are an mm -hmm. alternative alternative practice like yoga therapy, but we still need to know, uh, you know, from the aspect of transitioning, what is really happening in terms of, you know, are they socially transitioning? Are they medically transitioning? And how can we provide alternative support? So I think all these are integrative practices. Yoga therapy is an alternative practice and Ayurveda is an alternative practice and we can all work together integratively we can find a fit there. We need to be very clinical. Ayurveda needs to be very clinical in its knowledge of, let's say, HIV and how we can work there. So I think that is the difference. What do you think that yoga therapy or even therapeutic yoga and Ayurveda are offering to patients or clients that maybe isn't being offered in allopathic healthcare? Right now, there's a lot of provider discrimination. So mm. the LGBTQ community is marginalized. And when they go to a provider, at least 40% of them have had one negative healthcare experience in the last one year. Add to that the fact that they have poorer health. They have poorer health because of minority stress. There could be four times the violence. So, you know, there may be some history of violence. Mm. In the one hour that, you know, we talk 
80 LGBTQ kids will attempt suicide. So there's the mental health aspect of, you know, the marginalization, all the physical health impact of the marginalization, cardiac health declines, say with racism. So here, when there is provider discrimination as well, or, you know, there are providers who are not as well versed with the issues of the LGBTQ community, then, you know, an alternative space can provide a healing space. But we need to be very careful that we are offering culturally competent care, that we have researched it well, the systemic oppression, that we don't re-traumatize. I think that's why we're here today, right? Is to help our listeners understand just that. This is not read an article and you're ready to work with people. So let's just start by defining what does it mean to have cultural competence when you're serving the LGBTQ plus community? So I teach at Kerala Ayurveda and one of the modules I teach is DEI. And I often start with this one case, which is about Vietnamese women about 10, 12 years back, there was a whole study that, you know, post-pregnancy, they had issues with dehydration and therefore lactation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, being discharged was taking longer. There were negative health outcomes. And so it was actually, I think, a software engineer who was, you know, just putting together data. And they noticed that it was a cultural anthropology study. And they noticed there was something going on, not just in Midwestern hospitals, but in a lot of hospitals. And it was because like Ayurveda or like in Vedic studies, we consider pregnancy to be hot time, like a time of vata aggravation. The Vietnamese culture also considers it to be, you know, hot, cold. That's a hot time. They Everything needs to be warm. They need to be warm. They need to get warm food and so on. The care has to be tailored. But they were getting cold water with mm-hmm. ice cubes and they were refusing it. So it was as simple as the fact that they were refusing to drink water that was dehydrating them and impacting lactation. And that started this whole concept of how can we be culturally competent so we have better health outcomes. And that's the same thing with the LGBTQ community. So culturally competent care is providing care which is relevant to a community, a certain identity which meets their needs, their unique needs. And therefore, for the LGBTQ community, we know that 7 to 10 percent of the world's population is LGBTQ. But 64 countries criminalize being LGBTQ. And of that, I think around 29 former British colonies, which, you know, India was also a former British colony. So a lot of that is colonial mindset. Mm -hmm. And yet it has stayed And so the LGBTQ community already has poorer health because of discrimination. They also have issues of healthcare access. They also have issues of within the healthcare space. So they don't have the same healthcare rights. And so that's a double whammy. So how can we provide them better care? That is something that I was very passionate to explore. Do you feel that a non-LGBTQ person can really understand and treat or be with someone who needs this type of care. Like, for example, I'm a, you know, heterosexual woman who's married to a man. Like, do you feel that even in all my studies and allyship and my parents being LGBTQ activists for my whole life, do you feel that somebody like me could really get it and understand the cultural competency? Or am I just going to continue to step in the areas that I just don't have a clue about and then traumatize people? That's such a good question. A lot of people ask me that. So I work in a lot of spaces of advocacy with the Trevor Project, with HRC, with PFLAG, and that is not medical and not healthcare related. And so we do training. We do a training for allies and that training is very simple. We do a gender 101 training, which is 45 minutes. And one of the things we tell people is that it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to ask questions. So we train them with something as simple as mirror the language. Don't make an assumption. We look at somebody and we immediately assume, okay, this is 
cisgender woman that may be a non-binary person so instead of in our class saying ladies and gentlemen <laughs> we can say yogis or meditators so there are simple things we can do and then you know we can ask somebody and we mirror their language so will you be bringing your spouse to the class and they, they say i will bring my husband then you know to continue along those lines even in our intakes we can be very very mindful if they fill a form we can ask questions and then we lean into confidentiality so we tell them that if they want to that can be an option they want to disclose things that is fine if they don't that's fine the other thing we often tell people is you know ask questions don't be afraid like pronouns mm -hmm. share your pronouns they'll feel safe and if you make a mistake you can say sorry and move on sometimes we say don't even make that about you a lot of people make that about us. Did we get it wrong? And then the person is, you know, they've said it's okay. And then they're really uncomfortable all over again. So it's okay to make mistakes. I have made so many mistakes, but what I did was because my kid is LGBTQ. So mm -hmm. that helps because I did a course on queering identities. I felt I really needed to know everything. And I've been very respectful. I think as long as we are respectful and loving, we can absolutely, absolutely, I can say so with certainty. I have so many kids who come through my doors telling me their stories, so many clients. We can absolutely work with them. And in the case that we might make a mistake, is it best just to correct it and just move on? Absolutely. Just correct it, move on, and then we can go on and educate ourselves. As long as we know, we make mistakes all the time with everything. As long as we know, you know, we have this training. And that's why the culturally competent practices are so good. Because, you know, we say, okay, you need DEI training. You need to know that, you know, this community has vulnerabilities. Let's say the trans community, these are the risks that they face. And so, you're aware when you deal with them that this is what we are up against and this is what is likely to come up and and so you're very mindful in your management of their care can you give us a few places we could get some cultural competency training i know we in our yoga therapy program we have several days on this but what are some groups that you recommend because i can put those in the show notes or do you I do training? I could. <laughs> I wish I could, you know, I am so happy to hear that yoga therapy has this kind of cultural competency training. Mm. Ayurveda does not. Mm. So even the DEI curriculum at Kerala Ayurveda I introduced, it was, you know, all based on that's where I got the case together. I all through my research, I found a lot of casework. I actually teach DEI, what is diversity, what is equity versus equality, all of that. And then I talk about cultural competence and then cultural humility and how Ayurveda fits in. So that's something that, you know, we now teach every batch at Kerala Ayurveda. The NAMA, uh, the National Ayurvedic Medical Association had a DEI committee that I was part of, but that's been dismantled. So it's been gone through its okay. ups and downs. Can, so, can we so pause nice. for a moment there? I've <laughs> talked to some friends who are affiliated with NAMA and now National Ayurvedic Medical Association. Are you allowed to say why that was dismantled? You know, I think NAMA went through a lot of restructuring so that, you know, we're trying to make Ayurveda a healthcare practice. Mm -hmm. So to get licensure, we have to go state by state. And that's going to be really like traditional Chinese medicine. That's going to take a really long time. So I think the intent was good. We've been there for a long time. And actually, it was with the Black Lives Matter movement that the DEI committee was formed because initially they said all lives matter. And then they realized that that was a big goof up. So that's how the committee was formed. And in fact, Alaknanda Ma was, she's where she runs Alandi Ashram. She has a strong DEI curriculum of cultural competence care in her curriculum at her school. So there are a lot of schools who are making the initiative. But I think somehow they have been talking about resurrecting the committee. It's just not been a priority. You know, we discussed this at the NAMA conference, but it's not been a priority. 
Okay, before we move on, you also had another word that I think is really important for our listeners to understand, the difference between cultural competency and cultural humility. So can you unpack that for us? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's very relevant in the yoga therapy space and very relevant in the Ayurveda space. Because in cultural competency, let's say we are training ourselves, we do a DEI training, we do a training about the LGBTQ community, we understand the terminology, we understand the healthcare risks. We even try to have some people in our staff, you know, who are LGBTQ. I don't want it to be performative, but it helps. Representation helps if there's mm-hmm. somebody you know, who we employ and to say that we are a safe space and affirming space to have that out there. So all of that and in our care, we have learned about the community, but then even that can create, you know, stereotyping. Mm -hmm. So, but cultural humility involves essentially an other centered approach where we try to learn, where we have curiosity about their background, their identity, where they are from, their ethnicity, if they are LGBTQ, are they cisgender, are they from gender expansive, and what does that mean? And so it's a respectful, personalized approach. And I think that's the strength that Ayurveda and yoga therapy have that, let's say in yoga therapy, we may be in a class, but we still take a personalized approach. We work with people one-on-one. In Ayurveda, we have to work with people one-on-one and personalize their care. There's no one size fits all. There are 7 billion (laughs) protocols that we have. So it is a tenet of our management. You know, when you talk about centering the other person, that just resonates so much. I've been having a coach that has been making me practice not using the word I, not bringing everything back to me like, Anu, I'd like to understand cultural competency. Like that's again, centering me. You're having to work to center me. A better way to say that would be, Anu, would you like to share with our guests, you know, some ideas around cultural competency? Like keep it on you, keep it on the focus, the purpose, instead of like, hey, can you do this for me? It's been really interesting to just watch all my conversations and try not to center myself in every conversation. And you realize how much we just do it automatically, even if it's with good intent to try to connect, it's still always centering ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, you know, Stevie had this beautiful Insta post about when they go to a provider, they have to explain to them about their identity, which is really so unfair because they have to explain what are their issues the provider should know. But then again, the provider needs to ask without reopening trauma. So I think even in cultural humility, it has to be that fine balance is so important. And how do we attain that fine balance, which is where, you know, awareness is so important. And that's awareness of our own unconscious biases, our samskaras, our vasanas in you know, that we study in Vedic studies, our own centering, our own meditation, which is why when I speak to you, I feel like I'm talking to a real yogi because you are, you know, you're so centered, grounded. Mm -hmm. And therefore that cultural humility just comes through. It just comes through. I just feel like I am the person totally comfortable in the space who can talk about anything. I don't know. I think it boils down to curiosity about other humans and how they're feeling and what their experience is. Just that passion to know the heart of another and curiosity. I think at least, you know, not to center myself again, but in my experience, that curiosity is very much at the heart of cultural humility and appreciation. Yes, curiosity. And that creates a safe healing space. Mm. That healing space is so important for, say, the LGBTQ community where there's been so much systemic oppression and understanding that systemic oppression is so important, too, in our spaces. So switching gears a little bit here, I want to hear about your paper that you've written on best practices, but can we just take a step back for a moment? Do you have any information in India in, you know, maybe 500 years ago or 100 years ago, have the LGBT community been accepted as an important part of society? Or do you think there has been a lot of systematic oppression? 
So it really started with the, you know, there are different times in Indian history, 5,000 years back in the Vedic times with yoga, Ayurveda, they talked about 50 plus LGBTQ identities. And that was part of my research that included trans and non-binary and lesbian and bisexual and gay men, everything. So it was talked about and their healthcare was discussed. And fast forward, there were all the invasions. The invasions brought some homophobia. Mm. I mean, look at our temples. Our temples are in India. They <laughs> depict every possible sexual orientation, gender identity. Even Shiva Shakti is non-binary. My guru, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar says that, you know, consciousness itself is he, she, they, them, non-binary. But when the British colonized India, that's when they actually banned the LGBTQ mm. community in 1833, I think. They also banned Ayurveda. So when all the advances, scientific advances were happening, Ayurvedic schools were banned, like my great grandmother was a Vedya, she could not practice and she was badass. So she continued practicing in her village because that's what gave people access to care and the homophobia that crept in continued. So growing up, I always wondered, why don't I hear about LGBTQ people? Because we would see some, read some books, Oscar Wilde and how he was jailed and, you know, one of my friends came out to me and we all supported him and he couldn't come out to his dad who passed away. It was the biggest sorrow of his life and he actually had to move away from the country and get married. So it was only when I came to the US and my kid came out to me, I realized, okay, I didn't hear about LGBTQ people because that was a criminal offense. And that actually in the Ayurvedic field, which is healthcare, that restricted data. So, you know, whether gathering data and understanding the community, all of that got restricted. So in society, definitely people pathologized the LGBTQ community, even in healthcare, there was a big research in 2023 about hospitals. And so many of the mental health providers thought that, you know, being LGBTQ was a mental health issue. And then whereas that had been dismantled, there was a huge ruling in 2018, the Supreme Court decriminalized being LGBTQ but the society's negativity does continue. There are a lot of people advocating and fighting and, you know, they're saying, OK, remember Vedic times and so on. So it's a mixed bag. There are some villages where it's completely accepted. There are some where it's not. There are one sees pride parades and there are some middle class families where it is accepted, some where it is completely not. And then conversion therapy is being practiced. So one of the reasons I got into this search in Ayurveda was Patanjali is very famous. Ramdev, but they have all these clinics. There was a sting operation in 2016 where people posed as homosexuals and went, you know, as the LGBTQ community and as part of the community and went and said, you know, what can I do? And they said, we can cure you. And we can cure you through panchakarma or we can cure you because this is just weakness. This is just a mental health issue. This is just a hormonal issue. We will cure you. So there was a big article about that. And then there was a raid on a lot of centers, other centers too. And that was my whole point. Now, even in the US, conversion therapy exists. And there are medical practitioners, TV and I discuss, who use Ayurveda or use Vedic astrology to say, okay, you know, in your chart, this is happening. And so that's their way around. So I really felt that it's very, very heartbreaking. It's appropriation of the intent of Ayurveda, which was always inclusive. Yoga was always inclusive. Vedic sciences were always inclusive. Therefore, you know, not just in India, but in the US right now, we see these what we call culture wars, you know, this transphobia, there are 500 plus anti-LGBTQ bills that have been introduced. There's so much hate, misinformation, and I'm fighting that. So I'm doing that as my advocacy on the side. Mm. Therefore, I felt at least in the Ayurvedic space and in the yoga therapy space, can we make this a safe space? Why do you think when the British came colonialism, like what are people so scared of? I don't understand. I think about this all the time. Like, why does it matter to anyone else who you want to be or how you want to express yourself or the people you want to love? I just can't understand all the fear and hatred around that. 
Yeah, in fact, you know, I go to an affirming church for PFLAG support meetings and they actually screened this movie, I think 1946. It is where there was a misinterpretation of the Bible where homosexuality was never considered a sin in the Bible, but being a pedophile was, right? you know, so there were just some words that were misinterpreted, but that's fairly recent. The concept of binary existed in certain cultures. It did not in many indigenous cultures like, you know, Native Americans have two spirit people. India has the Trithiya Prakriti. So we really did not have the concept of binary, but colonizers wanted to introduce their own way of life, their own systems. And if they felt that marriage should be between only a man and woman and that gender expansive people don't exist, non-binary people don't exist. That was one of the things they imposed. Mm. Ayurveda is not a science. Hindi should not be taught, you know, so there were all these things they imposed about how people should be, live, you know, we were considered pagans. My great grandfather was shot in the, you know, I don't mean to laugh, but people celebrated in the village every year. So it was just everything about them that, you know, they were subhuman, I was called subhuman. Even today, like there's a election going on where, you know, I'm being called that brown lady. And I'm like, really? I mean, you couldn't find something better about me to talk about. So it's very easy to find somebody marginalized and bully them. Mm. And I think that's what tends to happen when people either politicize an issue because it helps them for political gains or they strongly believe that I am right. And there may be some good people out there, but they are also brainwashed into believing that they are right and they must go and transform everybody and they must get rid of all this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. you know, I talked to my dad a lot about this because he was the Lutheran minister for like 45 years and he helped the Lutheran church transform and allow LGBTQ people to be pastors and youth directors. And yeah. it was a big part of that. And he said, going back to the original words in the Bible, people were like traveling. There were no hotels back then. So if you had to travel from one place to another, you needed to stop at people's houses and they would feed you and let you stay overnight. And the original word in the Bible that people now point to and say you shouldn't be a homosexual was basically do not sexually assault your travelers. Yes. Like, and somehow that got, you know, transformed into homosexuality is bad. And so it's really interesting how so much can spin off the mistranslation of a word. Yes. So much hate, right? And it's happening in Ayurveda also. In Ayurveda, we can't say we are all good and this is all bad because we need to examine everything about our own practice. So because it was happening in Ayurveda, the conversion therapy was happening in India. So I had to examine it. So I can't say, okay, you know, maybe, maybe that was its origin. The origin was the, that was the history, but we are still doing it. We are still pathologizing LGBTQ people under Ayurveda. And that's what we need to dismantle. And so I wrote to the Ministry of Ayush, can you ban conversion therapy? But I didn't hear back and I, I don't know how to reach them, but I will keep trying. And Are you worried I, about your safety when you do things like that? Like when I hear yes. that, my whole like being kind of prickles up and I'm like, oh, I hope, I hope you're safe because those are powerful people. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, if I think of what is happening right now in the elections, I'm worried about my safety. So many things get spun around, but then I'm not a member of the LGBTQ community. What do they go through? So I try and sit back and think, what do they go through? And that makes me stronger. But sometimes you just feel so depleted because they call people groomers and it re-traumatizes for somebody who's been abused. It re-traumatizes us. Right now, the misinformation is to call LGBTQ people pedophiles and groomers and send them death threats. So definitely, and a lot of the anti-LGBTQ groups, I am scared. I am really scared. But you know what? I think of Audrey Lord, who was a lesbian poet, and she said, you know, you'll be something to the effect that you'll be scared if you're silent. So you might as well speak up and be scared. And you know what? If it does some good, so be it. Oh, Anu, that just really is hard to hear. Thank you. Sorry for that. And 
if anything happens to you, I promise I will spread this podcast far and wide, you know? Thank you. You're so sweet. Oof. All right. So all of this has led you to this doctoral dissertation that you wrote for your Ayurvedic degree on best practices. So tell us what best practices even means. Some people, that might be a new term for them. And then what do you recommend? Yeah, best practices is something that I heard in the software, you know, engineering industry. Like these are the good practices which you can adopt and you can actually roll out to the industry. These are evidence based. So there is a research which backs up. Okay, this is how I should take care of this community. That's why I use the term best practices because I was doing all this research. I did both primary and secondary research. So I went through all the texts and all the papers and then I interviewed 30 where they are one of the things that all the Vedya said was that you need to have a trauma-informed approach and a personalized approach, which is pretty much a given. But trauma-informed, whether people had worked with LGBTQ clients or not, they all said that. Mm. That was one thing that they all said. And some of the interviews I did in India with Indian Vedyas, they all said, we expect trauma, we expect marginalization, we expect stigma, we expect violence, we expect cancer, we expect mental health and physical health issues. So it was heartbreaking. They knew because they had worked with people. And it was interesting. I worked with the first trans doctor in India, mm. is an Ayurvedic doctor. Wow. Dr. Priya, and she's such a queen. Like, so she said, so many people come to her, they pretend that they've come for some digestive, some kind of cardiac issue. And then they tell her, look, I'm transitioning or, you know, I'm a lesbian. Like, how can you support me? And she told me how hard it was for her, just her existence. But she had a lot of support from her family and her hospital. She's with Sitaram Hospital. I think that made me figure out that we need to understand what are the barriers for care. And the barriers for care are, you know, there's no feedback mechanism right now because we don't capture data. We don't say, okay, are you lesbian? You know, are you transgender? So we don't have a feedback mechanism, but the Western medicine system does. There is an association of affirming physicians, GLEMA, which I'm a member of. And so I used their pointers to ask the Vedyas, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And then stigma, of course, is a big issue. There are no institutional policies within Ayurveda, which I'm trying to establish, non-discrimination policies, best practices, and there's a lack of training. So very often, you know, I will talk to a Vedya and they'll say, I really... I understand transgender. I know that there's, you know, there are puberty blockers. I know that there are surgeries, but what am I supposed to do? I then asked them back, what do you think you should do? And they said, integrative care. If they're doing any surgeries, we just provide them dietary and lifestyle suggestions. If there is some complication from the surgery, we just support them. That's it. I think it's really important there not to say, okay, I'll give you shatavari or something, you know, just don't mm -hmm. interfere at that stage and be openly affirming. We do not know about any Ayurvedic practice which is openly affirming, which is why Kerala Ayurveda now is openly affirming. That's something that I worked on, Stevie worked on. Dr. J actually gave a statement. We did a number of pride features. We are openly affirming. We know LGBTQ staff knows they are safe. Students know they are safe. Faculty know they are safe. Practitioners know they are safe. And that really helps. We talked a lot about public health measures, which is to train people in culturally competent care. So Stevie and I have this whole dream that we'll set up an institute and we'll do this training for integrative spaces, set up a nonprofit. Oh, you and for sure are doing that. That is done. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and we want to talk about specific issues like HIV, mental health, safe sex, gender affirming care, about setting up community centers in community centers, which already exist talk about integrative health because it's so important diet lifestyle you know exercise yoga all of these things are so important for mental health management also band conversion therapy and we are not HIPAA compliant right now not mm -hmm. required to be 
but we want to stay ahead of the curve and we want to be HIPAA compliant. So I think that's really important. So in best practices, we want to train on medical issues. We want to honor pronouns. It's interesting that came up so high. The Vedya said honor pronouns, honor chosen names. I loved it. Train on identities. Gender identity should be there in your intake form. Pronouns should be there with a rider. If you don't want to disclose, that's okay. They also talked about having national differences in training because let's say we have yoga therapy in India and we have it here. We can acknowledge that things are different and DEI training is so important which a lot of schools don't have. The intake form should talk about natal sex because we need to factor it in and sexual orientations. You know, intersex people don't come out. 67% don't come out and yet two in 100 people are intersex because discrimination is so high. So training staff is important and state that our practices are forming. Like I said, you know, maybe you can have this poster where two men are holding hands and mm. A gender neutral bathroom is just the regular bathroom we have at home. It's so simple. There could be surveys to assess care, collate identity wise data. So all of these ranked very high. And I was so happy. These are like common sense. Yes. There's nothing really hard about these things. No. Be a good no. person, love one another, support yeah. one another, be open in your support with one another, let yeah. people use the bathroom, treat them as you would any other human and be kind to them. Like, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. And yet, you know, forget Ayurvedic spaces, like in our school system, I had to call the police because, you know, somebody started this whole thing about, oh, this kid was in the locker room and my daughter saw them and a parent actually said, I would hit them in the privates if mm. I encountered a trans person. And I was like, you're a parent in the district. You're saying this in writing. Yeah. What are your values? And somebody's saying, I'll out the kid. There is so much hate. And yet I would much rather believe that there's so much love. I saw it when I interviewed all these people. I work with all these loving people in this space. The Sangha is so important where we find loving people. And it's just that our love can be louder. The mm. small number of hateful people are just so loud and yeah, the practices that they do and in spaces where we actually heal, whether it's yoga therapy or Ayurveda, if we bring in our biases, we do so much harm. We are supposed to do no harm at the very least. So it's so important to be loving. Yeah. Well, I feel like that that's the bottom line. Is there anything else you'd like to add that we didn't get to today? I think that's it, that just healing, to create a healing space that involves mm -hmm. understanding our own biases. One thing I'd like to add is if people know that, you know, they have an issue, refer people out. Mm -hmm. Don't take the client. 47% of Ayurvedic people were referring people out either because of competence, like they felt, okay, they need to see a psychiatrist or they need an allopathic doctor, a Western medicine doctor, or they need another way. They are more trained when they are. So it's okay. And if you feel that for some reason, let's say religion or whatever, you don't want to work with somebody, don't refer them out. That way you're doing the best for them. I agree. We all have blind spots. We all have areas that we're still working through for whatever reason. It's okay to say, I'm not the best support for you at this time. And yet I can't understand it because it's not like saying I don't like my coffee. Yeah. That is like, I just consider it bigotry when you say that, you know, but do, but it's just me. What I have noticed, and I know what I'm about to say is going to make some people mad, but I think a lot of people who have trouble in this area have not fully examined their own sexuality, their own gender identity. They have oh. things that they can't say to themselves, admit to themselves. There's just work to be done. And so I want to even send love to them to go do that work for themselves. Oh, I love that because, you know, that internalized homophobia, that yeah. is very hard for them to live with. And that makes them hateful to all the hateful people out there, sending them blessings and love because it must be very hard to be 
them right to be in their skin and to all the people in spaces like yours that are doing all this loving work having these conversations some of which are difficult i have so much gratitude mm. we're all in this together right that's yes we're, we're yes. creating sovereignty for all humans yes yeah so Thank you. Thank you, Anuradha Gupta. I'm going to share as we close out here this organization that you mentioned. It's the GLMA. Can you tell us what GLMA stands for? Earlier, they would talk about Gay Lesbian Association, but it's the Association for Affirming LGBTQ Affirming Physicians. I'm a member, Health Professionals Advancing LGBTQ Equality. It doesn't translate. And I will actually be at their conference talking about my research. So my research got accepted wow. there. And PFLAG, I'm on the board of our local PFLAG. So that's, you know, an advocacy organization. This is an amazing organization. We should all try and be members. It will be very helpful. Wonderful. And if people would like to find you to talk to you, I see you are on LinkedIn. I put in your name, Anuradha Gupta. Yes. And then I just put in Ayurveda because there's there's a few Anuradha Guptas on LinkedIn. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You're very popular. And I'll try to put that in the show notes too. And any place else do you want the Kerala Ayurveda website? I see that you are a faculty there. Do you have a personal website you'd like us to share? Uh, it's Ayurvedic Footprints. Mm. So because we believe so much in sustainability, we want to leave gentle footprints. That's where Ayurvedic Footprints comes from. And that is our website. We are still working on it. But I and my Vedya, we have a little practice of our own. Mm. So there's a lot <laughs> going on. I've written a book unveiling healthcare. So yeah, there's a lot, but people can reach out to me through my LinkedIn. And do you do private sessions with people? I know so many parents who their children are coming out as LGBTQ and they are struggling with that transition, whether they need to use new pronouns or a different name or just that place where you want to love your child, but you don't know how to do it properly. Do you work with parents in that capacity in private sessions? So I do Ayurvedic work. So that's if they want to seek out Ayurvedic healthcare. And we do have LGBTQ clients or people seeking support for LGBTQ kids or family members through Ayurveda. And then PFLAG is a nonprofit that was originally parents and families of lesbians and gays. It is the oldest nonprofit in the US, which is affirming. Now we just say P flag because of course it includes all identities, you know, two spirit, LGBTQ, IA. So that has 400 chapters in the country. Wow. I am on the board of our local chapter and we have support group meetings. Wonderful. So, People can just find their local P flag chapter. There's so can many you spell of them. that for us. Yeah, it's just P F L A G. dot org. dot com. There are different chapters. If people just Google P flag and then find your chapter. Okay. They will find chapters. There are also communities. They have, you know, virtual meetings. Military families have virtual meetings. Gender spectrum care, virtual meetings. Grandparents have virtual meetings. Black community, Latino, Asian, AAPI community has specific meetings. And these are all virtual. But then, you know, our chapter, for instance, has meetings in person once a month. Mm -hmm. So it's, nice. ours is srvpflag.org and people can absolutely reach out. We are a team. We go for support group meetings and support families. Mm. Well, thank you, Anu. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and I wish you luck in presenting at your upcoming conference. And I hope you get all the support in the world to let you know how much we all appreciate you doing this work. Thank you. And I'm so grateful to be here. It's such an honor. Thank you. All right. I just want to thank Anuradha Gupta for being here for us, for helping us to learn and grow and figure out what our next steps are as individuals and as a community to make sure we are being inclusive, to make sure that we are setting the stage for future generations to be able to give people their God-given right to health care and 
you know, the way she outlined it, it isn't that hard. We don't have to even do that much. We just have to be decent human beings who are open and kind and loving and willing to speak out and willing to put our neck on the line a little bit to let people know that we agree with this. So maybe you can just make a little effort today to go look at your marketing on your website, to look at some of the posts you're putting out there, some of the Facebook lives or TikToks that you're doing, look at the conversations that you're having with people and be willing to advocate, be willing to bring this up and talk to people and tell them your opinion. And let's all do this together and start educating people to give them more cultural humility and cultural competency in the area of healthcare for LGBTQIA. All right, everybody have a great week. And it's so lovely to be with you every week. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you for listening to the Yoga Therapy Hour. We hope that you enjoy this content. Much of what we talk about goes right into the other work that I do. One of the really exciting things coming up soon is a program that I'm running with Mala Cunningham called Mental Health, Neuroscience, and Yoga, a peer counseling certification training. There'll be two parts. One of the parts will be online and the second part will be in person. And at the end of this program, you you will be a certified peer counselor who knows how to be in relationship with respect to mental health, neuroscience, and yoga. It's a two-weekend program, and we can't wait to invite you to learn more about it. If you're interested, go ahead and email welcome at theoptimalstate.com. Again, welcome at theoptimalstate.com, and Mala and I will get back to you to let you know the dates and locations of the program. All right, I hope you'll join us. Let's talk soon. A special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines. Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada. Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria and Peter Morley, who wrote and produced the music for this show, who lives in Australia. Find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.